so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. It's 12.15am, two days before Christmas in 1995, and Sally, as we'll call her, has just arrived home to her apartment block in Balgala, Sydney. She's walking down the driveway in the dark, metres from the safety of her home, when a man's hand suddenly grabs her across the mouth from behind. She feels something sharp and cold against her neck, and a gruff voice tells her, don't say anything or I'll cut you. She's pushed against the fence on the side of her driveway. Where's your money? He asks, as he stuffs something, material maybe, into her mouth. He fondles her breast, undoes her jeans, and pulls down her underwear. Sally is raped by the stranger in a crime that he will repeat seven more times across the next year in suburbs across Sydney's North Shore. His victims range in age from 16 to 39. All are left traumatised. But that's not the end of his reign. This is the story of a repeat offender, a man with suspected sexual sadism disorder, who even in 2022, more than 20 years later, is still terrorising women. He's still doing the same thing, and the public is just not safe. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking to former police officer Craig Guze about serial rapist Graham James Kay, who terrorised Sydney's North Shore in the 1990s. Graham James Kay, tell me about what you found out about his life outside of his, you know, criminal rap sheet. Well, we investigated him uh, back in 97, I think it was, and I was only familiar with after getting a briefing from the actual investigator, so I was working proactively with the job. As far as I knew, at that time, he had lived on the northern beaches somewhere along the line. I know he had, uh, I think, two two sons. He had split up with his wife and he'd apparently met a, a younger girl and he was living at her parents' place out at Kenthurst. That was at the time of the investigation. During our briefing, we were just told about what he was, uh, well, he wasn't actually a target at the time when we first started it was just what crimes had happened and uh, there was a DNA sample on a number of women after sexual assaults and uh, that's all they had at the time. That's what you were able to find out about his life at the time of the investigation but it's also reported he had committed a, a number of criminal offences in his early life. He received his first conviction at age 19, charged with assault for touching a woman inappropriately, and there were a number of other assault and peeping Tom offences. So already as a a younger man, he was showing signs of being a repeat offender, but it wasn't enough to land him behind bars. As a police officer, when you do come across someone like that early on in their life that is showing signs that they could become a sexual offender, how do you deal with someone like that? Um, it's a very hard thing to do. You, you don't know whether they can be rehabilitated or not. And you can't put someone in prison when they haven't done anything to warrant it No, that's it right. No, no. Well, there's a lot of other sexual offenders that are similar that mm. we've caught in the act as well. And uh, they have past history for it, get out and repeat it again. Do you just watch them? <laughs> you cannot do anything else. Yeah. You know, we're there to protect, I suppose, and that's all we can do. And in Kay's situation, first we didn't know that he was the perpetrator, but from day one when we'd started doing surveillance on him, he was definitely our man. There was no doubt about it. And I've had one before where uh, we saw a photo of a sexual perpetrator who was just released from jail living in our area. I was coming home from doing a shift. I was working plain clothes. Saw him on the side of the road and we ended up following him and he went straight into a unit, saw a car come in with a husband and wife who went to the ground floor unit. We got out and hid from him. Watched his actions. He went in and was doing peep and prying as they got changed in their bedroom. Mm. Caught him in the act. 
and that he was just out. So straight back into the uh, the can for him. I want to skip to the first crime in this series of crimes that he ends up going to prison for. The first one happened at around 12.15am on the 23rd of December 1995. What was his general MO in those crimes? All we were briefed on was that he was using a knife. He would usually follow the women down to an apartment block. He would force them either into a secluded area in the block or down to the car parks. He would threaten them with the knife to do certain acts. And if they didn't do these acts, he was virtually threatening them with their life. And I think that's what the judge said at the sentencing, that these people actually feared for their life. They weren't attacks where it was just spontaneous. He was hunting. There's no doubt about it. He was a predator. In the media, he earned the nickname the North Shore Rapist because that was his hunting ground. He preyed in that specific area. He was definitely doing the North Shore, North Side. There was no doubt about that. I suppose living at Kenthurst. He was on his way home from work. We did find that he was, um, when we first found or him as a suspect, he was working over at Redfern. But he definitely was on the north side and uh, the word had got out. There was definitely media attention to it and there was warnings. We had a similar rapist a few years prior to that and uh, I think it was still on alert that you know people were quite wary of these incidents occurring in the north side. Was there a point? that you are aware of that police started to link them together and oh, that the media started to get a definitely. hold of it? That's why the North Ridge Major Crime Squad started the Strike Force Alley, I think it was called, and um, they put together a number of investigators then to investigate it. It became more serious. Obviously, he had upped his game with the threats that he was doing and, and the acts of violence towards women, and that's where we came into it. I think they had exhausted all their inquiries on what they were doing as investigators. There was nothing that they could do and they wanted to start to um, use their analysts and target suspects that they saw were in the area. Our actual group, we were the um, special operations group, we worked plain clothes. So we were sort of like uh, hidden shadows, I suppose, and we were there to target the proactive. So if we were put onto a target, we'd follow them and we actually could eliminate them or say, yes, they looked like they were a target. By the time you were put onto looking at this series of rapes, there was eight victims yes. that had been attacked month after month. There'd been more and more. So by the time it got to the end of 1996, there'd been eight victims. Do you remember being briefed on that and what they told you? I did. Well, the women I think were between 16 and 39 at the time. He usually wore a jacket with a hood to hide himself, also with sunglasses. His description was he was cold-faced, average height, Caucasian male. I think he's probably around uh, 50 at the time. And apart from that, there wasn't a lot to go on. The women, I suppose, for what he did to the women, they were in shock a lot of the time, so the description wasn't fantastic. There were a couple that uh, could describe him, which later on, the um, scientific police were able to get a drawing or a sketch that some of the victims were able to give us. And that's eventually that sketch led us to uh, him as a suspect. So I think it's worth pointing out that we don't actually know any of the names of his victims. They've remained private. And I guess that gives you an idea as well as to how traumatised they are by what he did. 100%. And I could see why as well after uh, watching him for the time. He was very cold-faced. That was very frustrating actually doing the job, I can tell you. You were also living in the area, weren't you? I did. I was living on the north side. A lot of us were. So Personally, um, how do you deal with that, knowing that there is this guy on the loose? Well, it was hard. My wife at the time was a mad runner and she'd go out early in the mornings in the dark and you had that in the back of your mind. You know, a lot of the friends who you have work in those areas where he goes around, but uh, I suppose you don't realise who's out there, who you walk past every day. You mentioned earlier that the victims helped put together a little bit of a, you know, a, I think it's called a Penry photograph. Penry photograph, yes. Can you talk us through that process? Yeah, the Penry photographs are usually taken by our scientific unit. Uh, a victim will come in and, and sit down next to the officer and they'll go, you know, from hair to eyes to the nose and the pitch of the chin and they virtually put together what they believe is identical to the offender in their memory and they'll match it with someone else. So if there's maybe three that thought they had a great look at him, they will um, all do individual penries and then try and match them together. I'd actually just come off an attempt murder. So I didn't start with my group at the very start of the job. 
I had a guy that was shot point blank range through the mouth. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Did three weeks on that job and then came over when this penury was just done. And they'd already targeted two people who the detectives had thought could be suspects, a guy over in Newtown and a guy at North Sydney. Worked out that neither of these guys were the ones. What ruled them out? They were eliminated because one actually was a chef and he was working mainly the hours that these attacks were taking place. So he started at three in the afternoon and finished at 11 at night. The other one, after they uh, followed him, just didn't fit the description. Completely different build, completely different look. And uh, again, he just didn't fit the MO. So when I came in, the penury had just been done and had been put in the paper. When the penury was put in the paper, someone from a uh, factory over in Redfern said, man, this looks like one of the guys who works here. It's, a, you know, the same image. Same day, a lady rings up from, I think it was Artarman or Gordon, and said she'd been followed from the train station by a male and she felt that he was approaching and was just about to get her and she turned around and tell him where to go. He backed off and went back to his car and cleverly she took the car number. She went back home and put the car number on the fridge under a magnetic fridge holder and kept it there. And when she saw the penry and the story with it, she rang the Crime Stoppers. So the detectives got the same name. They got the name from the penry photo from the factory and then they did a car rego and it came up to this Graham K. Is that unusual? Because obviously when you put a penry out, you're hoping something like that comes forward, but that feels like a very, you know, <laughs> divine intervention of things kind of falling into place. Hopefully it was an intervention for the women out there, <laughs> yeah. I tell you. Well, that's what you do it for and that's what, it was great investigation work by the North Region Major Crime Squad to get that and it was a fantastic link for us. We then targeted him from the very next day and we started out at his work address in Redfern at three o'clock that afternoon because we knew that what time. We obviously had a uh, person who worked there who told us. Mm-hmm. So we were able to uh, get information from them. And then from day one, he was out prowling. He would get in his car, virtually drive over the Harbour Bridge and go around train stations, universities, all those things on the north side. And he would spend two to three hours just roaming around these train stations, watching, peering. Is that on foot or in the car? In the car. So he would just kind of loiter and drive around? Yeah, just looking at all these women walking out of the train station. He'd stop and park and watch and... It was quite eerie, but this didn't go on for one day. This would go on all the time. So how long were you following him doing this? <sighs> now, this is going back a while. I've got <laughs> no records here, but I would say it was at least two to four weeks we worked on this guy every day. We virtually worked on him not 24 hours a day because he obviously slept and went home to his partner. Most of the offences occurred after work, obviously during those times from three till seven. Mm-hmm. But we followed him until he finished work, until he got home, because knowing that he'd stay home then with his partner and then go to work the next day and then he was busy. So for yeah, at least two to four weeks we were on the case seven days a week. Even on weekends we watched him as well. Practically, what's that like, just watching someone? Does it get boring or? Oh, well, that's the old expression is hurry up and wait. We used to hurry <laughs> to jobs to wait for days, you know. Yeah. And you could wait for months on a lot of drug jobs and things like that for something to happen. But that's what part of the parcel. But on the other hand, we were 100% this was our guy. And we Why? had just from his actions. Right. That is not normal. That is not normal what he did. And just the expression of his face and the way he looked at women and he would follow women, but we had no reason to in those days to be able to stop him. There was no uh, offence just to do that Mm. and what he was doing and to prove that he was the one. We wanted to actually nail him for what he'd been doing. When you say, you know, you could tell from his expression, can you expand on that? What was he like? It's a hard thing. He did have that cold face to him. And when he was looking at women, it wasn't a normal look. As Mm. If I was out driving, doing things and even looking for someone, There's a difference between looking for someone and looking at someone the way he was looking. Sounds really unnerving, especially when you have to watch this guy every day. It is, and uh, it's very frustrating, Mm. very frustrating. I guess to a point where um, he'd love to go and grab him. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with former police officer Craig Gouzet about the North Shore Rapist. 
So you're obviously, you're watching these guys' movements, you're following him. What's the tactic? What are you waiting for? Well, we virtually had to wait for him to actually approach a woman and virtually nearly grab her. Back in those days, we had no cause to be able to get DNA samples Mm -hmm. under suspicion. We knew we had DNA samples from him and the only way we could get it was whether he committed an act in front of us or whether we could actually get a DNA sample from him. Obviously, to ask him for a DNA sample, he's not going to give it. And uh, we had to wait for him to do that. And I suppose that's the way we caught him. After all this time, he hadn't uh, attacked anyone for some time and I could feel his frustration as well. I could feel the sense that he would have to do something soon. And I think it was a Thursday night. He used to go to a technical college over at Ultimo and we sat off the tech college this night waiting for him to finish. He'd usually go pretty much home. He might have a bit of a prowl before he went home, but this particular night he went over to William Street. So in the middle of Sydney, for those not from here. Now, back in those days, Red Cross was alive and well. Yep. Prostitution was huge. Mm -hmm. William Street was a a big pickup area, and uh, that's where he came. It was unusual for him, so we're sort of going, what's going on here? He did a lap around the block at Riley Street, I think it was, and um, pulled up next to a prostitute. We had actually placed a listening device in his car during the time. I do want to ask you about that before we move on to the city bust because you actually had to like be quite careful timing-wise with that listening device execution. We always do. <laughs> you know, we always, um, in the frame of work that we were in, we dealt with telephone intercepts and we dealt with listening devices and tracking devices. Back in those days it was a big thing. You know, these days your mobile phone's basically yeah. a tracking device. But back in those days it was a big thing. It was a big help to us. So how did you actually get the listening device in his car? Well, when we work um, undercover, it's sort of like undercover, I suppose. We just don't infiltrate into these groups, but you just got to blend into the society. So we're in old cars a lot of the time. Sometimes we're in a new car. A lot of the times you just blend in. So if you're at the beach, you're just in boardies, no shirt, barefoot. If you're working out in another area, you could just be in um, building gear wheelbarrows in the car, etc. Like actors. Pretty much, pretty much. You just got to blend into the environment. So what were you dressed up as on the day that you put the tracking device? I was just in boardies. <laughs> and what was your job on that day? My job was to, from memory, was to um, keep my eye on him in the surf. He went from Long Reef Car Park, which is a quite a good walk down to the reef. He went surfing. Mm-hmm. And then you got to paddle out through the reef. So mine was just to keep uh, observation on him to make sure that while we're doing certain things, he didn't come back. Is that nerve-wracking? Because you you would be the one to kind of radio back if he's coming too quickly and... Yeah, well, it's probably not as nerve-wracking as some other things that happen. Very true. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot that happens uh, in certain jobs where you get put in a situation where you don't want to be, but you yeah. got to uh, get out of it. And, and so he didn't far, suspect that you'd put no, the listening device? No, The listening device worked out really well. Most of the time he's in the car by himself, but... We had reason that, you know, he could do something, he could talk about something in the car even to himself. And that was important to try and get that in for evidence later on down the track. But uh, we did have a listening device in there and this particular day when he did pull up next to the prostitute, he um, wanted to get a head job. And uh, the lady told him how much and he said, okay, jump in and she directed him around to a back lane. We got people in position in the back lane on foot and uh, obviously... Our monitor could hear what was going on in the car and the deed was done pretty much in 10 minutes or so and uh, we were hoping for the best that the prostitute did use a condom. Why? It would be our DNA sample in a package. And that would be legal to take? Yeah. It was thrown out the window. So you were just hoping that, one, she would use a condom and, two, she would throw it out a window? Well, we never knew where it was going to (laughs) go. You were just going to try and locate that condom. There could have been DNA on her shirt, on her wherever. Right, so, okay. But luckily enough, that's why we put someone in the, the alley to try and uh, watch what went on. And we have to show continuity, of, obviously, of evidence. So once it was thrown out the window and they took off, our officer had to secure that till we got scientific police to come down and pick it up. But uh, he ended up taking it back and uh, he said, I'll get some money out of the ATM machine. And uh, from memory... I went back to near where she was picked up and she got out of the passenger car to walk over to the ATM machine and he took off, never paid her. She was there yell- left yelling. We sent one of the officers in and uh, grabbed her. I think two of us went back and followed him all the way back home after that happened to put him to bed. 
but uh, she ended up having the rip packet of the condom, the plastic, which matched obviously the brand of the condom and the semen that was there and she ended up being a witness in the matter. So does it move quite quickly from there or do you have to send that semen off for analysis? Does that take a while? Well, back in those days it did take a while. This was a Thursday night and I think it took till the Monday. So you would have just been waiting, waiting, waiting. It was. We're still working on him. Uh, obviously putting him to bed, making sure he still he didn't attack any women mm-hmm. um, up until the day. And uh, it came back, I think, the Sunday or the Monday and it was positive. So you can imagine what we were like. We were ecstatic. And the detective said, okay, look, Following him back from work on the Monday, we'll be back at his Kent house, house ready to arrest him when he comes back. But he never got back there. On the Monday, he uh, left work and went out and ended up stalking another woman, got out of the car and followed her. And one of the uh, officers, one of our officers just grabbed him and said, uh-uh, you're not going to touch him and arrest him on site. We didn't need him to do anything. He was under arrest. So You didn't even have to wait for him to kind of no, put a hand, you could no. intervene. Yeah, it was an important thing. Yeah. You, know, you, you can imagine put yourself in the position walking home and you get grabbed by the bloke, just him touching you on the shoulder and and then all of a sudden the police coming in. 100%. Yeah. Even that would be unnerving for that woman. For like sure. Nothing happened to for her. Sure. But, you know, watching all these police descend and hearing about what he'd done. Yeah, so who's arrested in the act, which was fantastic. Yeah, for you guys. It was one of those special jobs, you know. There's a lot of times when you do jobs you don't get the success. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of times you do get success, but this was a special job, especially with a, a serial rapist. Usually they're caught later down the track or they're known to the offender, their family members, or et cetera, in sexual assaults. But to have these ones where he's raped so many women and then to actually be able to catch him in the act and watch it, and then I think because of what we saw and how he reacted, he got a massive sentence. He got 18 years, 20-year mm. with a, obviously an 18-year he spent. So I think he got out in uh, 2015. Yeah. And then he was on a supervision program. And, you know, talking about repeat offenders, <laughs> you know, he, he's gone back out. I think it was 2017 and he's grabbed a young 16-year-old in Woolies and tried to cuddle and kiss her. He was, what, 66 at the time? Yep. And then in January this year, I think it was, on the 2nd of January, he was uh, caught again. He was wearing a um, ankle bracelet, which they put on sexual offences for supervision and et cetera. So he was wearing one of those. And that gives virtually a location on where he goes to. A female was sexually assaulted down in Haymarket in her apartment block and they were able to trace it back then to CCTV, which matched his ankle bracelet. He had followed her from the Queen Victoria building for a number of hours through the city while she was shopping. And um, I'm only going off what the media, because I've been out of the job for a long time now. Mm. He ended up following her into an apartment block, doing the similar what he used to do. Went up in the lift, she pressed whatever floor it was with a swipe card, he's jumped in the same, pressed the same thing without a swipe button and ended up uh, sexually assaulting her. There are calls tonight for a notorious rapist who terrorised Sydney's North Shore 25 years ago to be locked away for longer after striking again. Victims' advocates are demanding a continuing detention order to keep him behind bars and keep the community safe. Graham James Kay, dubbed the North Shore Rapist, has struck again. He's still doing the same thing and the public is just not safe. Despite his violent and lengthy criminal history, Kay was sentenced to a minimum 12 months behind bars. The serial rapist will be eligible for parole on January 6. So uh, he finds himself back in again, so he's not rehabilitated whatsoever. How does it feel for you knowing you spent so long tracking this guy, catching this guy, making sure he was behind bars to see it happening again? Well, I really do hope that they have a a look back at what's going on. Mm. You know, he got that first sentence because what he did, he obviously hasn't learned. He's not going to. I think he's 70 years old now. I don't know what the answer is. You know, the judicial systems are complete, another kettle of fish. Yeah. As an ex-copper, it's quite frustrating to see some of the results that come out of these things. But 18 years was a great result for us. Yeah. Like, Um, as you said, it was something you celebrated. Yeah, yeah. But it's always been one of those jobs where it was quite satisfying, you know, because we did catch him and he did get a sentence. And it's it's sad to see that he's come out and he's still doing it in in the same way. That is a sad side to the job. It does get to you. It's quite stressful when you're actually watching these guys like this and what they're doing and yeah, it's one of those hard jobs, but satisfying in the other end. And I guess at the end of 18 years, 
you give someone a chance yeah. to see if they've reformed. But what do you do if someone can't be reformed? I don't know the sentencing. You know, the assault is nowhere near what he did back in uh, 96 with yep. the women. So he didn't have a knife and he didn't have any penetration or anything like that. But still, for a young girl to be groped and done like that and another young lady down Haymarket, you know, the sentencing should be far more than two years. Mm. He got uh, two years with a one-year non-parole, so he could come out again in January. In some of these latest cases that have been before the court, I have heard that the court forensics have brought up the idea that he has sexual sadism disorder as like a bit of an ex- not an excuse but a reason as to why he might be a repeat offender. What do you think about that? Well, there's definitely something wrong there, isn't there? It's mm. not normal behaviour, what he's doing. Mm. And I pity that if he does get out, the next woman that he's approached and attacked, it's uh, it's a shame because it shouldn't happen and um, there's only one place for him, I think. In the last few years, we've seen this real reckoning of women coming forward and telling their stories of sexual assault and of rape and, and things like this. But watching someone like this who has spent so long behind bars and then gets out, it, yeah. it can, I can imagine, make women feel like, well, what's the point of me reporting it in the first place? Well, that goes back to the early days and I believe there was probably more than eight women. Really? After seeing what he had done for so long and how he did it, there's probably a lot of women that didn't want to report it. Mm. And that's the nature of being sexually assaulted, that feeling that you get, you don't want to talk about it. Thanks to Craig for assisting us to tell this story. This year, Craig's released a podcast of his own which tells his story of balancing life on the force with his family's health battles in the early 90s and 2000s. You see, in 1997, Craig was part of an elite group of nine New South Wales police officers gathering intelligence on crime syndicate and drug lord networks and the corrupt police who protected them. At the same time, he and his wife got the news that their eldest daughter, Jessica, was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. Craig's podcast, Conviction, tells his story fighting these two simultaneous battles. You can find a link to it in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For the next month over our summer break, things will be a little bit different. Instead of looking at specific criminal cases, we're focusing in on the people behind the scenes of crime. Over the next few weeks, you'll hear from a criminal psychologist, a psychic detective, and a former member of a well-known global cult. That behind the scenes of crime special starts next week. We really hope you enjoy it.